I'd like to share a scripture reading uh, this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. This is part of Jesus' uh, larger Sermon on the Mount, uh, in, in which uh, he talks about uh, the danger of uh, uh, gathering riches uh, on earth, material possessions, as opposed to uh, treasures in heaven. And so I want to share that with you, Matthew 6, uh, verses 19 through 21. And again, this is Jesus speaking, uh, part of his Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, this morning I want to share with you, to begin with, an, uh, an economics lesson. This is, my, this is my actual economics textbook from uh, the University of Northern Iowa in my business classes back in whenever it was back in the day. But I want to read to you part of this is, this is basic economics, at least that what it was, you know, a few years ago. Uh, and this is the foundation of economics. Again, this is not theology. This is an economics textbook. This is what said, the foundation of economics. Two fundamental facts provide a foundation for the field of economics. It's imperative that we carefully state and fully understand these two facts. Since everything that follows in our study of economics depends directly or indirectly upon them. Okay, are you intrigued? Are you interested? What are those two facts? The first fact is society's material wants, that is, the material wants of its citizens and institutions are virtually unlimited or insatiable. The second fact is, economic resources are limited or scarce. In other words, the very foundation of our economic system means that our individuals and societies, uh, their demands, their wants are insatiable. In other words, uh, it goes on, says, uh, first, the desire consumers have to obtain and use various goods and services which give pleasure or satisfaction. It says material wants are, for practical purposes, insatiable or unlimited. In other words, the more people have, the more they want. Material wants, like rabbits, have a high productivity rate. <laughs> Furthermore, we cannot stop with simple satisfaction. Upon acquiring a Ford or Chevrolet, we may become interested in owning a Buick or Cadillac. In short, we may say that at any given time, the individuals and institutions which constitute society have innumerable, unfulfilled material wants. Did you hear that? This is a statement about human nature upon which economics is built, that people and societies will always want more and never be satisfied. How does that make you feel? You see, Jesus gave us a warning about that. That might be our natural human inclination. But God has something better in mind for us. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we desire to be like you. And receive the peace, the joy that comes from knowing you, having you a part of our lives. Help us to know that it is in giving that we truly receive. And sharing with others that we can know the fullness of your love. We pray now in this time of worship as we open our hearts to your presence and your word. That you would fill us with your spirit so that we can be changed. And make a shift to find the peace, the joy, the meaning that you have for us. 
Open our hearts now to receive your word as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the midst of our five-week sermon series about SHIFT 2.0. We're getting ready for Dr. Phil Maynard will be with us uh, the second weekend in June. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Phil Maynard, again, if you read in our uh, good news, is a coach that we've hired to come be with us as a congregation uh, to help make us be a, get, make a shift to a healthier place. Doesn't matter who you are, uh, we can always do better. The greatest athletes in the world all have coaches to help them achieve even more, the greatest potential that they can get out of themselves. That's why we're having Dr. Phil come be with us. And he's written a book called Shift 2.0. It's actually the second version of a book that he had written previously. He has consulted with churches. He's coached pastors, you know, for several years. And this is part of his, his, uh, uh, his work that we're reading ahead of time in preparation for him being with us on that weekend. And so there are five shifts that he's talked about. Pastor Heather started us out with a shift in thinking from membership to discipleship. That as a congregation, we're not just about members in a club. It's about how do we be disciples of Jesus all the time. Then Patrick uh, shared with us about the shift from serve us to service. That being within a congregation, it's not about what, you know, what it can do for us or what benefits can we get from being a member of a church. Now, how can we actually serve through the Friendly Thrift Center or places like that? You know, how can we really be about serving others uh, as part of our discipleship, our following Jesus? Then last week, we talked about uh, worship, shifting from the idea of worship as an event to worship as a lifestyle. In other words, worship isn't just what happens in these four walls during one hour a week. Our worship is our relationship with God that happens all week long, wherever we're at. So for those of you that were here last week, here's your test. Okay? What do we call this piece of furniture? A, a table. This is a table, and, and again, altar, we often call it an altar, but we kind of talked about how last week, when it was the altar against the wall and, and the priest makes a sacrifice like this, uh, that's an Old Testament theology of offering an animal sacrifice to God. In, in our center of worship in Jesus, Jesus made it a table where he shared with his disciples in that upper room a meal. Uh, and it is in that relationship that we truly, fully know the presence of God in our lives on a daily basis. And so I gave you the assignment about how many took, uh, remembered the table all week long and said a prayer every time you were at a table to eat food this week. Anybody do that? Raise your hand if you did. All right, good, good, good. You get an A, a star for this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, shifting from worship as something that just happens in here to worship as our, a lifestyle a living relationship with God. And the table being a reminder every time we eat is an expression of what God has given to us and, and shared with us and to thank God for it and remember God's presence in that time. So today we want to talk about a shift that a church needs to make, but also it's true for all of us as individuals from survival mentality to generosity. Now, Jesus had some, a lot you know, to say about generosity and, and how we live and, and what, uh, you know, how we find our meaning and purpose uh, in God's purpose for us in life. And I think Jesus knew human nature pretty well. And he gave us that warning about gathering up for yourselves material wealth on earth. How that will never truly satisfy us. That was the point about reading the economics book. That's, a, you know, that's, that's not theology, that's economics. Just a statement of humanity. Will, uh, human, humanity, human nature in general, is never satisfied. As a society, always want more. And don't we, don't we see that? Don't we live with that? Isn't that a struggle that we face? That we're never truly happy, or, or there's the danger of not being happy with what we got, because we're always interested about uh, what someone else has, or wanting more. 
You ever heard that story about the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence? Somebody once said that's probably because there's more manure over there. But the reality is, how is it that we gain relationships in heaven that are more important than the, what we have here? Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because the moth will consume them, the rust will destroy them, the material things of this earth are only limited to the material time on this earth. They will never ultimately give us meaning or satisfaction or safety. I mean, ultimately, I think people find their safety, their comfort in knowing that there's somebody with them. I mean, somebody, not something. Uh, so Jesus said, so put your treasure, or where, you, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think I've, I've shared with some of you that where I'm personally struggling with this. You know, because as a pastor, we've always lived in a parsonage. We've never owned a home. We're kind of late in life to this, but since we've, we bought a home, we own a home, I keep catching myself from saying, oh, I love our house. Oh, don't, I don't know I love that house. It's a material thing. But we've been so blessed to find a house that just meets our needs. And so I'm trying to correct myself. I enjoy our house, and I really love it when people share that place with us. We love to have the kind of the because we, we have a place where the kids can come and the grandkids can come and so on. But see, the danger of the house becoming more important than the people you love, you know, we have to remind ourselves the grandkids are here. It's a great, wonderful thing. Here's fingerprints on everything that we just cleaned up. <coughs> oh, well. I love it when the kids are here and we've got a place for them got to always remind myself, don't love that house because it's just a house. When it's said and done in eternity, you won't take that house with you. So Jesus said, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, what does that mean? What is that? I'd like to suggest to you that what is eternal, meaning the Bible said love is eternal, what is eternal is relationships, connections that you have with other people. And by that, I mean it's eternal. You know, at different times people say, well, you can't take that with you. You know, when people die and there's the comments about, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul uh, you know, behind it. But one of the things I've come to believe is that relationships that you have with other people, the love that you have with someone else, doesn't that even continue after a person dies? I mean, don't we know that? Don't you feel that? That their presence, their power, their influence in your life, your relationship with that person continues on even if uh, as Memorial Day we're remembering those who've gone on before us. Relationships are everything. And I think relationships are eternal. Now the good news is that God has said to us, I want to have a relationship with you right now. And when we know that and feel God's presence and God's love and comfort, we know that can be with us. We'll feel safe because that's our ultimate security now and even after we die. Forever. So we know this uh, when in 1 John, the, the, the reading that Aaron shared with us, when uh, uh, John talked about we know love by this. I mean, he's talking about love. What's love? It's a relationship. It's a specific type of relationship. He says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, that Jesus laid down his life for us. Jesus, as the Son of God, as God in the flesh, the very character and nature of God, laid down his life for us. That's how we know he loves us. He cared about us and to care for us more than himself. You see, I believe our generosity begins when we trust in God and know that ultimately we're in good shape, that God will take care of us. When we trust in God, we trust our, our uh, security is there, then we're more willing and able to give and share with others. I mean, I understand that if people are frightened or they're afraid or they, they're, they're, they're not sure that they're secure in themselves, it's hard to give because you're taking care of yourself. 
But then again, that's part of it. But what does it really, how much do we really need to, to feel safe or, or have enough? Do we need 150 television channels at our beck and command every moment? Do we need one, two, three, four vehicles or four car garages or a rental of attic space so that we can store more of the stuff that we've got? Is that what will ultimately keep us secure? Or when floods come or tornadoes or damaging or fires or rust or moth or robberies that might threaten our security. If we know that our security doesn't come from that material process or those things, but a God who loves us so much that said in Jesus, I'll give my life for you. Wow. If you've got somebody who feels like you, doesn't that think, oh, I'm, I can go to sleep at night. Somebody's got my back beginning with God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Johnny said, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And then he goes on to say, you know what? So that means we ought to lay down our lives for others. I mean, John goes on to say, I mean, because really, what does it mean? You say you care about other people, but if you've got resources and you've got things and you see someone else in need, you don't do anything about it. What kind of a relationship with that is that? What kind of a friend would that be if you're hurting and somebody else sees you hurting and they don't do anything about it? How would you feel? But how wonderful it is when you're in need and someone steps up to care for you. Have you ever experienced that? Don't you go, thank you. That, oh my gosh, that is so wonderful. And to know that's what it feels like when someone does that to you, then you can also get a hint of what it feels like when you can do that for someone else without needing a reward or not needing anything in return, but you can truly give of yourself for someone else and they know what a blessing it is, how happy they must feel, well, it makes you feel pretty good too. So it begins, I believe, generosity begins by trusting that God has got us covered and that we really got enough. Uh, ultimately, we'll have a relationship with him and then to be able to balance how much material stuff do we need to be safe. I'm not talking about you know, you need to be generous to put yourself at risk financially or any other way. But to be really honest about how much do I really need financially, materially, to take care of myself, that would then allow me to share the abundance with others. And that's part of the whole concept behind a tithe or giving in percentage. The more that you have, the more you can give. You know, the, the biblical standard of the teachings often of the church is 10%. You know, if you, you give, uh, you know, God gives you nine apples, you can give one apple to somebody else. And the more God gives you, the more you can give. And that really our joy comes in giving more than it comes in receiving. Now, that's the shift, again, not only that we want to make as a congregation or keep working on that, but also as followers of Jesus, as individuals. And so here's the, here's the main point I want you to make. Our true, or I want you to get, here's our main point. True joy and meaning in life come when you care about others more than yourself. That's how you develop treasures in heaven. You get that? True joy and meaning in life comes when you care about others more than yourself. That's how you develop treasures in heaven. And then it's a matter of, okay, how do we live that out? How can we move from just thinking about ourselves in a survival mentality to generosity? And trusting that we'll be okay so that everything that we've received, we can receive what we need, but then really give the rest to those who might enjoy it as well and be uh, in need of it. Now, here's part of what uh, Dr. Maynard in his book also says, the reality of our world today. Again, remember, this is a world that says the economics, that there's unlimited demands, that people will, the more they have, the more they'll want. So some of the statistics that he has, 82% of the people in our culture, our American culture, report feeling anxious about money. 65% of families live paycheck to paycheck. 32% of families couldn't cover a $5,000 emergency. 
63% of families don't pay off their credit cards monthly. The average mainline church giver gives uh, less than 3% or gives 3% or less uh, to uh, to their church. You see, we live in a culture where it almost goes against human nature to be generous and to give for the sake of others. And many people are caught in the, the, uh, the, the web of debt and, and trying to have more than they can really cash flow or afford. So part of what we want to do as a church is keep moving in the right direction and helping individuals be financially sound in their own lifestyles and their practices. Here's the old man coming in. Advice I give my kids, though, don't carry any credit card debt. I mean, whatever you can do to pay off your credit card debt, that's one of the worst interest rate things that you've got. So that means how do we change our lifestyle to live within what we truly need? And save up uh, so that we can have our needs cared for, but then we can have enough to care for the needs of others as well. Okay, I want to give you an example, uh, or or give you uh, somebody who inspires me to be generous. Somebody who inspires me to give of my wealth, my resources, my excess, the way God has blessed me so that others can be blessed as well. Okay? The person who inspires me is Roy Carver. Who's ever heard of Roy Carver? Amen. And what have you heard about Roy Carver? Okay, the hospital, well, there's a hospital in Iowa City. One of the buildings is the Roy Carver Pavilion. Who's ever gone to uh, the Carver Hawkeye Arena? And actually, the, the whole School of Medicine is the Carver School of Medicine at the University of Iowa. I believe he, even here in Augustana, um, the Augustana, there's a Carver um, building, the athletic building at Augustana uh, College in, in Rock Island. Somebody, uh, so Roy Carver the, that you're talking about, that you mentioned, that, you know, for those who aren't from this area, don't know, grew up in Muscatine, or originally from Muscatine, started three different companies, Carver Pump, Carver Foundry Products, and Bandag made a fortune, but then was also very generous with other institutions, primarily education and sports and so on. I was even at Morningside College a few weeks ago, and there was a brochure for Carver Scholarships. Uh, that students can get Carver scholarships all across uh, the state of Iowa. And I don't know anything personally about him or his life or what it was like, but you know you can't go a lot of places around Iowa and you cannot see the Carver name as, as an example of generosity. We kept trying to find a family tie. Uh, <laughs> we've not been able to yet, but we're going to keep digging. But I'm telling you today... Uh, Actually, what I'm thinking about, though, is Roy Carver, who is my inspiration for giving. And I want to show you a picture of Roy Carver. There he is. Isn't he great? That's my Roy Carver. Uh, That's my grandson, uh, named after uh, Linda's father, Roy Strobe. And so that's uh, the Roy Carver that inspires me to be generous. Because his future is what I care about even more than mine. And the world that he lives in will be part of the legacy that I leave behind for him. So it's not just about caring for his material well-being or for him, but also to create a world, to create a people where people are generous and kind and loving to one another. And I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the best hope that that Roy Carver has for the life that he has yet to live. And the potential that that Roy Carver has to make a contribution in the world is yet to be seen. But it will depend largely upon what kind of gifts and caring that he receives from others who love him. Now, a couple weeks ago, or last week, I guess, uh, you know, it was my birthday and my son told uh, Roy that uh, it was Grandpa's birthday. Well, how old is he? 60 years old. Oh, that's good because you don't die till you're 80. So I've got some time yet, according to Roy, but, uh, but here's what I want you to think about and, and consider uh, today. How we can move from a survival mentality, taking care of just ourselves, worrying about are we going to be okay or not, to generosity by caring for others more than ourselves. 
Because when you do, you'll find the greatest joy that there is. You'll, you'll develop riches in heaven through relationships that moth can't destroy or rust won't wear out. And it'll be there even when we face our final breath. That's really what God desires for us. And that's what we can achieve. So here's your assignment to this week. To be generous. In some way to give of yourself to someone that you cross paths with this week. And do it as an act of joy. Uh, knowing that uh, you're doing something for them that will uh, benefit them maybe even more than yourself. But it will be worth it. And as long as we're thinking about it, we're going to take up an offering now, too. And so you can be generous in terms of what we do together in the life of this church. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray that we would accept and receive the hope, the joy that you've given to us in your son, Jesus. And that your spirit would guide us now to be generous in all that we do this week. And all that we give uh, in your name. Guide us now as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.